Dara, the first staff photographer at the Village Voice, is responsible for some of the most iconic images from the Stonewall riots. Years later, when he was asked why he only took 19 photos of one of the most pivotal moments in American civil rights history, he responded, who knew? This year, to mark the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, the Museum of the City of New York is featuring those images in an exhibition called Pride, photographs of Stonewall and beyond by Fred W. McDara. To tell us more, we welcome Sarah Seidman, the museum's curator of social activism. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about Fred McDara. Who was he and why was he at the Stonewall Inn that night? So McDara was Brooklyn, Brooklyn born mm -hmm. and moved to Manhattan, made the move to Manhattan, I think after, after World War II and raised his family there and was definitely part of the beat scene and part of the village scene and came in on the ground floor with the village voice in the 50s and soon became the staff photographer and then the photo editor. And he was definitely just everywhere on the village beat, you know, photographing protests and concerts, uh, a lot of rock concerts. Um, so he was everywhere. We have a few contact sheets in our shows. One of them shows him at like an event and then at the birth of his second child and then at like another event later that day. So he was he was busy and he was local to the Stonewall Inn and also the Village Voice, which shared a block with Stonewall. So he wasn't there the first night when the riots, uh, when the uprising uh, really first broke out um, around 1 a.m. Um, so just in the wee hours of June 28th. And then um, protests continued for about six days. So he came that second night and captured uh, those photographs. And I think he might have even gone back for the interior shots of the Stonewall Inn that we also have on display in the show. So The Voice provided probably the most complete coverage um, of any newspaper in the city. And he was part of that. And what are those photos from the second night of the riot? There are a few of, um, of jubilant uh, groups of LGBTQ New Yorkers. Um, Stonewall was a pretty diverse, not fancy, but a pretty diverse place. And a lot of youth, a lot of um, uh, queer youth of color and trans folks, as well as gay and lesbian and, and bisexual um, folks. And they're kind of gathered in, I think, the iconic shot that he took uh, somewhat jubilantly on the steps outside. Um, so he has variations of that photograph. You wouldn't know that it was a riot based on that photograph. It does look just like a group of friends who are out for a fun night. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I think the second night was more celebratory mm -hmm. and the first night and maybe the third night had more um, first night for sure had more like looting and people either throwing the first punch or the first brick. Right. There's definitely still some myth around it. I think a few different people claim to, to have thrown the first punch. Um, but I think I think it's true. The second night was a little calmer and and uh, jubilant. But McDara does capture some of the some of the violence as well. There's a photo of a jukebox that has been destroyed. From yes. inside. Yes, right. So some of the damage to the Stonewall Inn itself and the boarded up windows that I think the, uh, the bar did. Um, and then they said, I think they said we're open still. <laughs> um, and then the Manachine Society, which, you know, of course, had been organizing um, around gay rights primarily, um, you know, for for years before then, they, I think, wrote something on the outside of the window. And they, uh, you know, they were ready to jump in and organize, which is pretty much what happened. And, and a big part of the reason Stonewall is as big of a catalyst, there had been other, um, you know, confrontations with police at LGBTQ bars. But I think the way groups jumped in to organize immediately after really got the modern LGBTQ rights movement going. And maybe that speaks to McDara saying, I didn't know it was a big deal at the time, that it was just another bust by cops on a bar where people of color and trans women frequented. But it was the immediate <laughs> aftermath when people decided to really make it uh, the beginning of a larger a larger revolution. Is that right? Is that, a, yeah. is that the right way to think about Stonewall? I think that's, yeah, I think that's definitely a helpful way to think about it. And and also with McDare's involvement that he just kind of happened to be, you know, the voice sent him over. He was nearby. But I think over time, you also see his kind of growing closer to the topic, you know, as someone who I think um, was sympathetic po politically, it was an ally, um, but wasn't necessarily part 
wasn't part of the LGBTQ community, um, that he grew uh, closer, I think, to the movement over time, and his photographs reflect that. But he also just was um, devoted to photographing liberation struggles in general. So his work features a lot of um, black liberation, young lords, um, women's liberation. So I think definitely as part of that kind of zeitgeist of late 60s activism, this you know fits into that larger context. You mentioned the Manuchin Society, and McDera is also responsible for the iconic image of the Sippin at Julius, uh, where the bartender is refusing to serve three members of the Manuchin Society for, because they were gay. Exactly. Um, I'm curious about what you mentioned that you had this affinity with sort of, um, you know, under underrepresented or marginalized communities. Was there anything in particular that drew him to the LGBT community? He himself was not gay, correct? Correct. Um, I think he grew up very um, working class or um, or impoverished. And from what I've read or from what his family members have said, you know, that he kind of saw himself as... Um, a little bit marginalized in, in certain ways, and I think maybe that drew him to uh, some of the uh, some of the political movements at the time. Um, right, he'd definitely been a part of the Beats and that countercultural um, angle from from that perspective. But but uh, yeah, I think with the LGBTQ community, the photographs on display we have about forty in the Pride show um, from Stonewall through 1994. We stopped at the 25th anniversary, pretty much, and it 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 shows I think the way he became kind of more and more. Um, yeah, like involved in some ways in documenting the struggle over over time. But you're right; it begins with with the sip in. He has a few other sh um, shots that are on display in the companion show to Pride, uh, Voice of the Village. So we have two shows. One's a larger retrospective of his work and sip in, and a few other photographs um, from before Stonewall. And then we pick up with Stonewall and bring it up to the 25th anniversary. There's also a beautiful image of Marsha P. Johnson. Was that taken? during the Stonewall riots or sometime after? That was after. I believe that was, I think it was 71, that photograph. Um, so basically after Stonewall, there was a, a protest about a month later. And and then from, from then we kind of document the pride marches not every year, but almost every year, um, and especially in the 70s. And he he really was there pretty much every year. So um, Marsha P. Johnson, we actually have a few photographs of her in the show. There's some great ones of her dancing at the Gay Activist Alliance um, uh, firehouse, which became a kind of headquarters of the movement, as well as that beautiful portrait of her at the, I believe, 1971 Pride March. I think the photographs, you know, capture some of the celebratory nature of being outside in the streets together, celebrating identity and, and love, as well as the kind of more serious political project of LGBTQ rights and equality. And of course, those things are are related. But um, yeah, I think he does capture some of the intimate joy that people are feeling. And you are a curator of activism at the Museum of the City of New York. What does that role entail? And talk to me about um, your recent your recent work, including trans people and sort of the story of struggles of activism in New York. I'd love to. Um, so I curate the ongoing exhibition, Activist New York, at the museum. And it's 14 different moments in time from the 1600s through the movement for black lives. Um, and pretty much we have some stuff right from today in there as well. And they change over time. We've had a section on the gay liberation movement up since the show started, um, which is actually 2012. It's been up for quite some time. And it's so exciting to rotate new content in every year. And we decided it was the perfect moment to uh, put in a new section on trans activism that really um, centered uh, voices and people like Marsh P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, who are such pioneers in trans activism in New York and really nationally um, from the city. And so um, we have, yeah, photographs and ephemera and kind of brings things right up to the present in that section as well. So we wanted to um, commemorate the 50th anniversary of Stonewall with those two kind of pieces, as well as programming and some of our uptown bounce block parties this summer. So 
every like everywhere across the city we're you know very busy uh, marking the anniversary and you know we uh, we can we hope to continue to commemorate and talk about these important histories beyond this month of course and and throughout the year and indeed the show is up until the end of the year exactly yes pride is up through 2019 Stonewall is now an event that most people know about. And if they didn't know about it before this year, hopefully they do now. But what do you hope that people take away from your show in particular? What new things do you hope that they might have learned? A good reminder of how hard fought uh, the, you know, rights and um, and resources for the LGBTQ communities in New York are um, and, and seeing those early Pride March photographs that I think are a little different than some later ones, you know, that are that are really protest photographs. Um, and 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 right, seeing the sip in photograph where um, patrons could be completely legally denied access to services in public accommodations or denied housing or employment completely legally. The city didn't pass a local ordinance outlawing discrimination based on sexual orientation until 1986. There was an executive order in place before wow. then, but legislatively, and it didn't cover trans folks until 2001. So I think just may not be new, but a constant reminder um, that, right, of how hard fought these these political rights are, um, but also just how diverse the participants at Stonewall were, um, and be it people of color, trans folks, working class, New Yorkers, and that we hope to capture that diversity in the show. Yeah, it's harder to erase trans bodies and people of color when they were photographed there. So that thank you, true. Fred McDara. <laughs> <laughs> um, the show is called Pride Photographs of Stonewall and Beyond, and it's up until the end of the year at the Museum of the City of New York. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thanks again.